Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, and government leaders. We meet each one to one. I'm pleased to welcome the writer Mary Carr to the program today. Her latest book, Lit, a Memoir, is literature with a capital L. As you explore Mary's life, you savor the art with which it's written, which is not a surprising reaction, as The Liar's Club, her first memoir, received so many accolades when it was published in 1995. Susan Cheever, no stranger to some of the issues Mary faced, wrote in her New York Times book review, you always knew Mary Carr wasn't telling you everything. There were tantalizing hints of adult life in her two coming-of-age memoirs, The Liar's Club and Cherry. But Lit is a book in which she grows up and gets serious, as serious as motherhood, as serious as alcoholism, as serious as God. And it just makes her funnier. In a gravelly, ground glass under your heel voice that can take you from laughter to awe in a few sentences, Carr has written the best book about being a woman in America I have read in years. Wow, how's that for responsibility? Oh boy, that's about, that's about <laughs> as good as it's going to get to be me, I think. Susan Cheever saying that about me, yeah. Your third memoir, why did you want to continue writing about your life? Was it for you? Was it for your son? Was it? It was for the money. Okay. I'll be honest. <laughs> okay. I didn't want to help any, demand. I didn't want to help <laughs> anybody with this. I needed the money. And, um, that's, and people wanted more, obviously. People did want more, but also, in, in fairness to me, a, a, as opposed to just another pig with her nose in the trough, when I wrote the proposal for Liars Club, it covered most of the material through Cherry and most of Lit. It covered through my getting sober. So, um, not through my finding God and becoming Catholic and my conversion and everything. But So, I actually did have this idea of a story the arc of a story that I wanted to tell, but I'd never written a book of prose, so I had no idea it was going to take three books. Right. So the title intrigued me, um, and I'm not sure what it's about. Is it about literature? Is it about being lit up, as in drinking? Or is it about both, or neither? What's it about? It's What's about. It's about. You got it, Cheryl. I've been, I've been, wait, I've been waiting to meet the, you know, interviewer who's going to get it all, and that's it. It's basically, yeah. It's about. Certainly, it's about my drinking, my sort of inheriting my hard drinking family's uh, taste for the stuff, and talent for it. Uh, but it's also, I do wind up converting to Catholicism. A very unlikely Catholic I am. Nobody really expected me ever to become Catholic. Now you started out writing poetry and your first published works were poetry. Who were your literary heroes when you first started writing? Oh, goodness. When I was a kid, you know, like kid writers, like A.A. A. Milne, and, but also E.E. E. Cummings. When I was a kid, I also memorized Shakespeare. I was kind of a, I was a nerd. Uh, uh, my mother had a big Riverside Shakespeare down in this little backwater in Texas where I grew up, and I used to, actually used it as a booster seat. And my sister and I uh, used to memorize passage, the great speeches from mm -hmm. Shakespeare. To, and when my mother was hung over, we'd sort of trot them out, you know, with a sheet on, being uh, saying friends, Roman countrymen, being Julius Caesar. So, um, so it is certainly about literature. It is certainly about drinking, and it's also about God. Couldn't have been easy being a nerd in Texas. They were hard on on me. <laughs> <laughs> really were, people always think of me as like this, you know, I'm from this rough, tough place and this kind of bad girl. And, you know, I was the sissy. You know, I was the one who got, who got her butt beat every day, you know, got hit with dirt balls. I grew up in a rough place. Mm -hmm. um, uh, still pretty rough, I've got to say. But, you know, I was not the big tough girl. I was the one sort of reading T.S. Eliot. And so literary heroes, gosh, I mean, when didn't I have them. It's funny, when I was in, like, starting about fifth, sixth grade, my mother marched with Dr. King, and I, oddly, I read a lot of books about being black. So, the autobiography of Malcolm X, mm -hmm. um, Why We Can't Wait, uh, Black Like Me, the Sammy Davis Jr. Right. Uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, Yes We Can, the Sammy Davis Jr., Black Like Me, about the guy who became black and, uh, and lived in uh, the segregated South. 
So I think I had this appetite for a single voice. And my Angelou's, I know why the caged bird sings. I uh, just got to meet Dr. Angelou, and I've got to say, it was the first time I had a sense that you could write about the kind of people I grew up around. Mm -hmm. Because my mother subscribed to the New Yorker, again, a kind of weird thing in this little town. And when you read stories and poems there, they're all about these guys in deck shoes who went to Yale and you know, or playing golf. And I never really, we were never really in any golf situations <laughs> where I grew up. So when I, I read uh, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, I did have this sense of, oh, I mean, obviously we're different colors, but that this was my milieu, mm -hmm. these were my people. It's interesting that dysfunctional as your childhood was, you always had art in it. I mean, your mother read, she subscribed to The New Yorker. I think you wrote about her taking you to plays and to the opera. Did you actually go to opera? Yeah, we went to the opera. And she, she painted or at least pretended to paint. Pretended uh, to paint. So, so your life was rich in an artistic and literary way. So this had to have influenced your becoming a writer. It certainly did. And also, I mean, I think I grew up with a great oral tradition. I, the storytellers and my father, who was a great kind of barroom gambler, loved to shoot pool and uh, shoot dice and, and uh, play cards, used to drag me around uh, to these bar rooms in Texas. And the stories the guys told and the way they talked, you know, they, to me it was poetry. To say mm -hmm. a woman had a butt like two bulldogs in a bag, to me, that's a piece of poetry. Right. It's, right at the edge of propriety. It's uh, evocative. It's um, funny, uh, surprising. Sort of all the things that I think great art should be and are. So I think it was that combination of this kind of hyper-literary mother and this great storytelling father mm -hmm. that was both a conflict in me and ultimately, I think, what led me, kept me on the page. Your books are filled with, and we'll talk about this, this book in particular, with over-the-top drama and over-the-top characters of the type that some would say, this is, too, is this almost too good to be true? Um, yeah, so I mean, the, that's what they say about my mother, I know. You know. The mother who drinks is a serial marrier who tries to kill you and your sister. The guy who writes a reference for you to go to college, but only after he's fondled your breast. The man who picks you up on the road when you're hitchhiking, who's crazy, funny looking, and also has snake breath. He has breath like a snake. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, there is a portion in this book where you're quoting from another writer from the philosophy of symbolic forms. Ernst Kassira. Who says, the same function which the image of God performs, the same tendency to permanent existence, may be ascribed to the uttered sounds of language. Now, I had no idea what he's talking about, but then you explain it. You said he meant that words shaped our realities, our perceptions, giving them an authority God had for other generations. Do your words shape your reality or vice versa? I think, in a, I think they have done in the past. I feel like now, and this is part of my spiritual practice, I think part of my prayer life and going to church and trying to get a sense, even if you don't believe in God yourselves, and obviously I'm writing for mostly, probably a mostly secular audience, that there's something bigger than me, I actually, I think words shape my reality a lot less. I, I was trying to, part of I think why I became a writer, Cheryl, I think I was trying to write myself into an acceptable form. Uh, I knew that I wasn't gonna make it in this kind of redneck backwater. And I, uh, but then when I get to this very white private school in college, I, I felt like I was trying to pass the whole time. So, in a, in a strange way, I guess every writer feels a little bit like a misfit, but I certainly felt like a misfit. So I think, yeah, I think initially my writing was trying to invent a self. Mm -hmm. And now I, I've got to say my head's quieter. Uh, there's less language in it. I feel like I do reality. There's a great line from Simone Weil that um, spiritual living is accepting reality at any cost, meaning at, at that time, I think she was talking about if you're in a concentration camp, she was writing just before she died in World War II, you face reality, you accept reality. And so for me, part of accepting reality is to shut off that language machine in my head. Mm -hmm. So you got a chance to go from Texas to this college in Minneapolis. You never said which college it's it was. It's McAllister. McAllister, okay. But then you dropped out. Why did you drop out? 
That was one of the self-destructive things I did. It's funny when you said, you know, all these things that happened are almost too good to be true. I had a little self-destructive streak or a self-sabotaging streak. And it's that conflict between my sort of working class background. My father was a labor organizer, you know, wouldn't leave the union. My mother had these had this big intellectual life and I kind of just didn't, I went back and forth between those worlds, I think. The truth be told, though, I think I had done really well my first two years in college at some, with some effort. I got there and everybody was way ahead of me. I had been the smart kid in my school, which means in that school I knew the alphabet beyond the letter J, I think. Um, it made me the smart kid. But, you know, I got to a college where kids actually had been reading books and thinking and, you know, learning French and, you know, looking at things. I was uh, underprepared, but I worked very hard my first two years. I had a lot of jobs. I had to pay my way. And I think I got to the point where I wasn't going to be able to make straight A's anymore, which I had never done before, mm -hmm. probably in like, I don't know, in grade school or something. But, um, and I was afraid of failing. But you did have a wonderful, meet a wonderful lifelong friend and mentor in Walt Mink, who Walt was a psychologist. I'm sorry. Walt Mink, yes. Which, who was a uh, psychology professor who sort of adopted you and stayed with you even after you'd left. And I've got to say, he was an amazing mentor. He's one of those people who makes you believe in God, even though he was a uber-rationalist, philosophy of science type guy and uh, laughed, you know, at the prospect of any God or any religious thing. But he was, you know, he was somebody who kind of snatched me out of the fire when I was a kid. You know, and this happens to me now, I'm sure it does you too, when you're a professor. Somebody comes in who's in a vulnerable state of mind and they start crying and sort of pouring their hearts out to you. And he got me into therapy when I was 19. His wife uh, ran an outpatient clinic at a hospital and got me, I think I had to pay $5 an hour to go to a training therapist. And, and I'm sure I still owe the guy 50 bucks at least. I'm also not. got you a job and, and some gloves. Got me a job, got me some gloves. <laughs> and they used to, you know, they used to hire me to quote unquote babysit their, their kids. Their son, Jonathan Mink, is now a very famous neurologist I just saw. And he was like three years younger than I was. I mm -hmm. think I was 17 and he was 14. And I said to him the last time I saw him in Philadelphia, he came to my reading. I said, that must have been so humiliating for you. He said, well, you, you soft pedal the whole I'm your babysitter thing. So, so it wasn't quite so bad as it might have been. But he had four beautiful, perfectly competent to be there without me there. But he and his wife were looking for ways, I think, mm -hmm. to subsidize my, my, uh, my enterprise. Yeah, and they offered to adopt me, actually. I, yes. Thinking that I could go to college when my financial aid was cut, thinking I could go to college for free as a faculty mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. Uh, but again, I f in a way, I was one of those kids who always wanted to be adopted. Uh, maybe everybody does, but I think if you grow up, I didn't really grow up poor, by the way. People, my daddy had a job, we owned a house, we had health insurance. I mean, come on, that's not poor. Mm -hmm. It's the richest country in the world. But uh, I think I, I did have a, a sense that I yeah, that I just wanted to be adopted by people who could pay my way to college. Right. And here were these people saying, we'll adopt you and pay your way to college. And it felt like such a betrayal. Of your own parents. Of my own parents. Yeah. That I couldn't, I couldn't have done it. We're going to take a short break. Then we'll be back with more with Mary Carr, author of Lit, after these messages. Okay. Mm. I'm a mommy. I love kids. I'm responsible, loving. Nurturing. <gasps> Mama's coming, baby! <laughs> you don't have to be perfect <laughs> to be a perfect parent. <laughs> Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy, and I'm talking with Mary Carr, whose latest book, Lit, has just been published by HarperCollins. So, as a young woman at this, well, you're, you're still living in Minneapolis, but you are attending this low residency college program for poets in Vermont, where you met Warren Whitbread, a handsome, wealthy guy whose parents lived on an estate. He's very grounded, a poet like yourself. How would you describe 
the attraction between what attracted the two of you to each other? Well, first off, if you saw this guy, he looked like something you'd win at a raffle. He was 6'5", he'd played a big waspy sport at Harvard, and looked like the guy who played Superman. The, you know, Christopher Re I mean, was just beautiful, strikingly beautiful, and could quote more Shakespeare than any guy I'd ever met. And um, we were both in love with poetry. We both, you know, memorized poems and stayed up and read poems to each other. So who knows what he saw in me. I think maybe, you know, it, you know, he was trying to, he, did, he was the only person in his family who didn't go to law school, uh, Harvard Law. They usually went Oxford, Harvard Law. And um, who knows what he saw in me. I think maybe trying to rebel against that aristocracy he was born to. He certainly didn't want to wind up on Wall Street like his father. And what did you see in him? He was smart as a whip. He was smart as a whip. He was enormously kind. He was funny. And, uh, you know, it's that young thing of opposites attract, but mm -hmm. I, I think I was trying to correct myself. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's something young people often do. You find somebody as opposite from you as you can, thinking you're going to... He was so staid and so normal and so... He did sit-ups every night before he went to bed. He, he, you know, I woke up in a new world every day. I'd get up and say, let's move to England and move to Europe for three years. And, you know, I, I was, had led this very itinerant life, and he looked like stability to mm -hmm. me, too. So what made you start drinking, and what made you drink to excess? Well, that's the big question, isn't it? I drank, I think I drank because I'm an alcoholic. I mean... I often think if I'd grown up, say, in the 50s, when there, there was less marijuana and more alcohol um, among high school kids and college kids, that I would have been an alcoholic much sooner. But I really put off drinking much until my early 20s because it wasn't cool. You know, it just wasn't cool to drink. You smoked pot, you didn't drink. And pot was easier to buy when the drinking age was 21. So... Um, what made me drink, I was certainly depressed out of my head, I think. You know, my mother tried to stab me with a butcher knife when I was seven, and this makes her sound worse than she was. She had a psychotic episode of her own, maybe drunk, maybe sober. She told it a different way every time she told it. But I think the stress of, of just trying to pass, of trying to invent myself as a poet, but honestly, I think they're, they'll find some genetic key to alcoholism. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, and I'm, both your parents drank. Both my parents were, yeah, my father's half uh, Native American. So, you know, the Irish, and my mother's Irish, you know, we've got wow. that Irish-Indian connection. We're, uh, they're big winners. Um, you know, the Italians and the Jews and people who have had alcohol in their culture for thousands and thousands of years have bred all the alcoholics out, I think. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the cultures, like the Irish and the Native Americans, so I think I drank because I'm an alcoholic. But I, I was just a binge drinker probably until my, my late 20s. I would just, but I was one of those people, I couldn't really keep alcohol in my house because I would drink everything I had. So mm -hmm. even though I didn't drink every day, I had a very intense relationship with alcohol, and I really, I didn't get in trouble every time I drank, but every time I got in trouble, I'd been drinking. Right, right. So it was one of those things. Now, the therapy group in Cambridge seems to be what pulled you back from the edge. Even though you had been, you had actually been in a facility, was it a, was it an inpatient facility for alcoholics or was it a mental no it's a of, mental okay. it was the mental Marriott okay no okay. it wasn't uh, it wasn't rehab it was um, I could have used rehab by the way no it was um, it was McLean Hospital uh, you know which is famous for taking artists on the on the loose a lot of famous artists Ray Charles was there uh, James Taylor I think Sylvia Plath, Robert Lowell, a lot of a lot of poets mm -hmm. went through McLean. But it was the therapy group that really seemed to pull you back. I think from the talking edge. to other people. I met a woman who was a Harvard social theorist. I jo is that Joan the Bone? Joan the Bone. I just saw her in Seattle, and um, she was an amazing woman. And and I was I was one of these people who maybe it was my depression, lifelong depression. Maybe it was the drinking. Alcohol is a depressant drug, but I could block out the bad news. And Joan the Bone made me make a gratitude list for every letter of the alphabet every day. And I was like, oh, come on. You know, at first, everything they told me about prayer and I was going to have to pray. Well, I, I've been an atheist my whole life. It never occurred to me to 
pray. So when I did these things, I did it just kind of like a chimpanzee would do it. I just got on my knees. I said, keep me sober in the morning. I got on my knees. I said, it was the only thing I had not tried. And uh, it seemed like everybody who was sober, that's what they were doing. So I just got desperate enough. I almost drove into some concrete. And my son was a baby. And, um, and I started praying. And so what is it? So who are you praying to? I think initially I was not praying to anybody. I was doing it actually I think to spite people to show that it didn't work. Somebody just said, and it's an interesting idea, pray on your knees every day for 30 days and see if your life gets better. What do you have to lose? I was like, yeah, if I don't believe in God, what do I have to, you know, why not just do this and then I'll get drunk again and they'll see that it doesn't work. Except that it did. Except that it worked. And um, so I probably would have said, I thought my big, smart, intellectual brain had hypnotized me. Even then, I didn't think, thank you, Jesus. You know, I didn't mm -hmm, think there was any mm -hmm. God out there. I probably would have said I was, when it began to work, and I began to get a sense of this quietness in me that I'd never really experienced before. I had so much anxiety and fear and, and anger. And uh, I would have said I was praying to a sober self. And then it kind of got beyond me as I, over the years, I would have said, you know, there's a force for good in the world. You know, there, most people don't want to boil you on their stove like Jeffrey Dahmer. Most people want you not to have a flat tire. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most people who bump you on the subway, it is an accident. And, and so I began to get the sense that I was just trying to reverence a force for good or a force for love. Uh, that's what I would have said mm -hmm. probably my first two or three four years it was oh. this very vague thing. And what do you say now? What do you think? Oh now I use the G word capital G I use the pray God Pray to God? Word. I pray to God and sweet baby Jesus and the Blessed Mother I mm -hmm. do. I became Catholic Cheryl. It's I know it's go ahead and laugh. <laughs> Who but would think me a Catholic that they would even let me be Catholic? We'll come back to that <laughs> but the the these I guess it was a 12-step kind of group um, they tend, they urge you to surrender to a higher power. Um, and it was interesting that uh, they said the higher power, it might be God or it might be the group. Might just be the group. Yeah. Because yeah, here's a room full of people <clears throat> who don't drink, who know more about dr not drinking than you do. So I thought, yeah, so I could go and I could say, you know, I'm gonna go to a wedding where everybody's gonna be drinking. It sounds, it's gonna be nerve wracking. Uh, how do I not drink? and then do what they said. So I, following that logic, that's how I wound up praying because I did not notice that the people who prayed and talked about some higher power thing or had some spiritual practice, did a lot of charity, did things for other people, right. also seemed happier. Okay. It was really binary. You could see those people didn't drink and were really mad all the time. And then you could see these people who looked sort of lit up and like they were having a good time. And they talked about this God stuff, so it was pretty, Evid you know, the evidence was there that they seemed to, it seemed to be working for them. And so you became a Catholic. Oh no, wasn't that silly? How did that happen? My son was about six years old. I was newly divorced. We didn't have a car. We didn't have any furniture. Don't get me wrong. I had a house. I had an assistant professor's job at Syracuse University where I still teach. And my son came in one morning and said, I want to go to church. And I said, why? thinking there's nothing he could say that would make me go to church. And he said, to see if God's there. So I thought, well, I've got to go. I've just, you know, I didn't want to take him to soccer either. So we did this thing that we called god a -rama, where we'd, um, whoever had any sort of church or spiritual mosque, zendo, temple, you know, we went to all kinds of Protestant and in all these places, I would not have said I was looking for a church. I was looking for him. I would bring a paperback and, mm -hmm. a, and a cup of, and a thermos. I would sit in the back and drink coffee and read. I, I had no interest in this. This is for Deb trying this to find God. This was for my son Deb right. trying to find God. So it struck me as, you know, tacitly ridiculous. And we got to this little Catholic church. My friend Tobias Wolf, who's a very famous memoirist and uh, short story writer, and it tells you how unlikely I was to become Catholic, was he was someone I saw every week. He was my colleague at Syracuse. And I knew he and his wife went to the Catholic Church, but it was literally like a year and a half into it 
bef this God Arama thing before I went to church with him and his mm -hmm. family. And um, you know, the priest was not some firebrand, anybody. He was a very humble, little traditional Irish priest. And um, I found myself putting the paper back down. Mm -hmm. And so he would have said, what I think actually happened, show this is true, I published an article in Vogue magazine, which I buy only for the articles, of course, not for the pictures. Um, I, uh, I published an article about this search for God, this god Arama thing with my son. I think some batch of nuns was like in the same dentist office, mm -hmm. and they all started like praying the rosary and right. everything, and God just got after us. <laughs> because we wound up, uh, it was years later. I mean, I went to this church for three or four years. They had a peace and social justice committee that, you know, was anti-nuclear, and, uh, you know, they did a lot of work with the poor, which I found very impressive. So a lot of it was the lay tradition. It wasn't the the splendor of the church. Right. This wasn't a very fancy church, but was the simple faith of the people and mm -hmm. the tradition of of the laity working among the poor, not just writing a check, but going and running right. a soup kitchen right. or you know, having, having interesting. people from El Salvador. And Fascinating. And just a, and certainly a, f a fascinating journey that you write about. And unfortunately, we can't talk about it anymore because we're out of, tan out of time. That's okay. <laughs> but I do want to thank Mary Carr for joining us today. Her latest book, Lit, a Memoir, has just been published by HarperCollins for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy.